just before the meeting, so probably about uh, two weeks ago now, which is Jeffrey's pullbacks in an uptrend template. Okay, so let's get going. Introduction to EdgeRater. EdgeRater is a program which allows you to do several things like backtesting, scanning. It has this capability of, of scanning in in what what I've termed 3D. Most scanning programs that you find on the internet or, or programs that you download will allow you to do scanning for things that are occurring using the last available bar of data, uh, which is great and probably is the most important bit of scanning you need. But what's really interesting for people who are interested in doing backtesting is the ability to do scanning for any prior day. Uh, and so I, I coined the term 3D scanning because when you run a scan, it automatically actually scans not just for today, but for all of the prior days in the, uh, for the, bar, the number of bars that you have in your list of symbols. Um, prospecting is another term for scanning. Um, trade simulation is to do with backtesting. So the idea is that you might, you might run a scan, uh, you might generate a list of entry signals with that scan, you might then generate a list of exit signals with another scan, and you put them together in, into a trade simulation, and it, and it produces for you a backtest report. We'll be looking a little bit at that. And then the big thing, with the program and the thing that most people use the program for is this idea of trading templates and there are many trading templates in the program new ones are being released every month what is a trading template it's really an encapsulation of uh, people's trading methods me their methodology and their ideas so for instance uh, you see here we have um, over here, there's a picture of uh, Gil Morales and, and uh, Dr. Chris Catcher. Uh, they've written several books. They have trading a website. There's a lot of people from Jeffrey's meeting who came to the meeting from uh, from Gil and Chris. Then we have uh, there's a picture of Ron Brown, Ian Woodward, Jeffrey Scott, and uh, George Lee. Just some of the people whose ideas and methods have been encapsulated into a trading template. So that if you're following these people, if they are your go-to people for trading, then the types of stocks that they're looking for, you can easily find yourself by using a template. And we'll, we'll show you how to do that. There are different types of templates. The, uh, I'd say the most commonly used template is, is a signals template, which basically gets you the last bar, using the last bar of data will provide various columns of information that can then, are then sort of put together um, into an Excel-like spreadsheet and calculations are run, on, are run on those to give you um, more refined signals. But there are also templates that do trade simulation. There are uh, templates that do market timing, designed for market timing. Um, and I've put these into the custom category here. Things like the percent B buckets, and we'll look at that. Um, Hindenburg Omen ranking and so on. And then template, the idea of a template is, is that it is, um, it's something that I put together one per month, but it's also, also something that anybody else can put together themselves as well. Now it's a little bit tricky at the moment to put your own templates together due to the, uh, I would say, lack of documentation in doing that. But as we go forward, there'll be more and more information on that. And you can always use one of the existing templates as an example and modify it if you if you have a need to to have something that is very close to what's already there. So as I said, the new every month and, and uh, create your own. So first of all, we'll talk about um, data. I'm not going to talk about downloading trial right now. I'm going to stop this and we'll take a look at data. So one of the important things to know if you really want to get to grips with the program and know where your data is and where it's coming from, then pull up a uh, file explorer. And by the way, you don't need to do this to use the program, but this is, I'm just, I'm just going to show you this because this essentially is where all of the data is stored, all of your data. Whenever you do something custom in the program, it's all stored in the file system under uh, your documents directory. There's a subdirectory called edgerator. 
and then under edge rater there are the various folders that are used within the program so the important folders to know here are there's a folder for symbol lists all right you can see it just contains a bunch of text files if I opened up one of these files for instance let me open up the weekly options.txt file and I'll, I'll just open this up in notepad you can see what it looks like it's basically uh, one line per symbol you have the symbol here then you have a comma and then you have the name of the of the security and so on and so forth there's no actual stock market data or price history in this file that's that's something else and that's I'll show you where that's stored in a second so a symbol list is just a text file it can have the .txt extension that's common in Windows operating systems for to denote a text file it can also have a .lst extension it's exactly the same file just has a different extension and edgerace will recognize .txt files and .lst files the reason that it recognizes .lst files as well is that by default HDSI exports groups as .lst files and I'll show you how to do that so that is a symbol list so whenever you do an export of groups from HDSI um, as lists you put them into this folder. It's important to know the first time you do it. From that point on, it's set, and you never have to deal with it again. Um, obviously, that can be a problem too, because then you forget where it was. But uh, uh, but, but that's where it is. The second thing it, that's important, and this directory you never actually have to um, uh, copy things into, but this is where the price history is is contained. It's in the snapshots folder so whenever you update a list a symbol list in the program so let me take an example here weekly options.txt weekly options list contains all of the securities that have weekly options associated with them in the snapshots directory there is also now a weekly options.txt.erd erd stands for edge rated data and ERI stands for Edge Rater Index. So basically, the symbol list is associated with this file, and this file contains the price history. I can't open it up in a text editor, it's not a text file, it's a binary file that contains the price history that's been downloaded from wherever you get data. And for HDSI users, you get the data from HDSI. Okay, so those two things are, it's you know about file system, it's not very exciting, but uh, I think it's kind of important because I do get a lot of questions about um, where the data is stored, so I just wanted to cover that. Okay, so now I'm going to go into HDSI. And for those who have HDSI, you will be familiar with this. For those who don't, you can, you can always take a trial of HDSI. And you don't need HDSI to use EdgeRater, but it, they do work very nicely together. And HDSI, when you do an update in your HDSI program, you get the latest uh, stock market security price history information and fundamental data um, downloaded from the HDSI servers, and it's put uh, locally on your file system in, a, in another location, and we're not going to worry about where that is. Okay. Once you've done the update, you'll find that you have your various lists in here and groups for instance your group of all securities will be updated uh, you'll find that if you look in major market index components these are some of the default groups that are contained in the program uh, say you you wanted to look at the S&P 1500 then this folder in HGSI contains a list of all of those securities and if you double click on any one of the securities you bring up a chart within HGSI and the last date of data that you have is uh, obviously on the right hand side so you can see what what data uh, your date goes to which is July the 2nd it doesn't have today's data data in yet it takes a couple of hours after the markets closed before HGSI will have that data available there are ways around that if you're using edge racer and you want to get hold of data um, and I'll show you that in a second so as an example what I would want to do right now is I'm interested in the S&P 1500 and I want to get that list into EdgeRater. So what I'm going to do is highlight the list. I'm going to select File. 
and I'm going to select ASCII utilities and then I'm going to select export groups as lists. Okay, it brings up another dialog box. This dialog box is the location that you're going to export this group to. And remember I said it's in the edge rater folder under documents under, under symbol lists. So um, if I hit browse, then on my system it's already defaulting to that location because I have previously exported lists to this location. So um, on your system the default will be somewhere else and you'll have to navigate through the file system over to documents, edge rater and then down to symbol lists. And just leave the name of the file as whatever it is defaulting to in HDSI. In this case it is a .txt file but you may find it's a .lst file on your system. Okay. Also, I like to make sure that I have the format set to, to symbol common name. Remember when I opened up the notepad uh, showing you what was in that text file, it had the symbol as the first part of the line, then a comma, and then the name as the second part. So that's what will happen if you put symbol common name. Other options in here are symbol only, um, and uh, those are probably the, the two that you'd only ever want to use. But if you don't include the name, then when you view a chart within EdgeRater, you won't actually see the name of the security. So it's always good to have symbol common name. And I always like to have these settings checked too, or unchecked. I don't want to include subgroups, and I normally, I normally um, would exclude indexes. So I'll, I'll have that checked. Okay, export complete. What has that done? Let's look at the file system now. Let's go back into the symbol lists folder. It's, you see it's just put this text file into the symbol lists folder. I'll open that up and now we have a list of the S&P 1500 with symbol comma name within the file. How has that affected EdgeRater? Well once you run EdgeRater and I, I'll pull up EdgeRater here and I'm looking in the security chart tab here if I use now on the left hand side of most of these tabs you'll see a uh, uh, symbol list pane, I call this a pane, window pane, and there is a drop down control here. When I click on that drop down control I can now see S&P 1500 has appeared magically because it's looking always at that folder to find the files um, and if it finds a file with a .txt extension it will appear in this in this drop down. I can select that and you'll notice that the area now is blank. That means there's no data associated with that symbol list right now within EdgeRater. So essentially what it means is the snapshots folder does not have an S&P 1500 data file. How do we get one of those? Well we make sure that this list is going to get data. When we hit the update data button we want to make sure that the data is going to come from HGSI. You could decide that it, it, it should come from, from another location, for instance Yahoo. but um, if you have HGSI you really want to make sure it comes from HGSI because it's, it's a very fast way of getting data. You also want to check on your data update options to find how many years of data you're going to be retrieving from uh, HGSI when you do the update. And then if you look at this data snapshot tab you'll see that the symbols are listed. Uh, the symbols are in the list but right now they're not contained in the snapshot uh, and we don't have any snapshot data. All I have to do to get the snapshot data is press this update data button. You'll see the progress as what's happening right now is it's just going out to the HGSI database, fetching the data for two years, and it's putting it into the snapshots folder so that the symbol list is now always associated with that snapshot piece of data. Once it's done that, you'll see that you have a uh, couple of other columns filled in. There's a check mark that it's contained within the snapshot and you'll see how much data you have. So a lot of people have questions about data um, and you know I get the I get the occasional question about I, I've run a report and, my, and I'm only seeing data up to a certain date. I'm not seeing data for today. One thing you should do to, to if that ever happens to you is just come in to this dialog box. So select the list, press the 
edit button, bring up this dialog box and click on the data snapshot tab. That tells you this is this is the amount of data that EdgeRater knows about. If the data isn't in here, it's never going to appear in a report. So, um, so it's a very important uh, piece of information if you're ever having difficulty with uh, with data. Okay, but now I've updated that. Let me just show you that it has actually created the snapshots uh, folder uh, file. So here we can see that there's now an SMP 1500.txt.erd. ERD stands for Remember Edgerated Data. And this file is, it doesn't really matter what it is, but it's 32 megabytes uh, big. Okay. So now I've got data in here. I can do a whole bunch of things. This, this is now, we can now start using Edgerator proper. Okay. I can scroll through the, I'm using my keyboard. I'm using my down arrow on my keyboard to scroll through the, uh, the symbols. Okay. That is a very basic operation. Um, and one other thing about data is remember that I said that a list, this list has been associated with HGSI. Well, you can set a default for all lists. If you go to the home menu and you click on data providers, place a check mark next to the data provider that you would like to get your data from. And that's just a default. It can be overridden by an individual list but it's useful for the cases where you create a brand new list and you don't want to have to go in and uh, change it to your, your the provider you use all the time. So, uh, so place your check mark next to the provider you use most and click OK. Every time you, if you uninstall and reinstall EdgeRater, you'll have to change that setting again. So um, probably the first thing to do when you, when you install the software is just make sure that setting is set to your, your preference. Excuse me. Okay. Um, I'm going to take a look at some of the questions here. Steve. Okay. Great. Thanks. Um, okay. So, a couple of questions. Clive. Uh, Clive asks, if you can get data from Yahoo, why can't you get data from Think or Swim? Well, you'll notice there are a number of providers that are listed as available in in here. And right now we have HDSI, Yahoo, Metastock. Metastock format is a file format that uh, most programs will export to. And then there's ASCII files. The, so these are the four available ways to get data. We don't have a way to get data from Think or Swim. Think or Swim do not actually publish price history or even export price history to uh, provide an interface to it. So uh, that's the reason why we, we wouldn't be able to get data, uh, historical price data from uh, from Think or Swim. Okay, moving on. Um, I had a few questions came up before the webinar asking about. Ooh, let me just bring those questions up. Right, asking about charts and how to deal with charting. So we'll go to uh, the security chart tab, which is which is at the bottom, next to the templates tab. And this chart you can see is a basic basic chart. There's nothing on it except for price. Uh, how did I get to this chart? Because there isn't actually a chart layout in the system that that is just basic, basic. So I'll show you how to get this, and this will this will be instructive about how to use uh, charts. So let me just just go and select a different chart layout. You see, I went over to the right hand side under layouts. There's the uh, layouts tab, and here's all the layouts that have been delivered with the system. Each layout is for a particular purpose. Uh, Jeffrey's pullbacks in uptrend layout, for instance, has a few indicators that are important to that uh, uh, that process. But if you wanted to create yourself a basic layout, and I recommend doing this, uh, the way to do it would be this. You notice the chart is divided into, this chart is divided into a main area and then two sub areas. So the main area, area contains your price, also contains a volume overlay, and then the sub areas contain 
other indicators. So let me get this to a basic chart. What I'll do is I'll click on one of the sub areas. It's now highlighted with this uh, salmon colored uh, title bar. And then I'll go up to chart settings and I'll click remove. All right, that sub area has now disappeared. Now the next sub area is highlighted with this, with this salmon colored highlight bar. I'll click remove on here. So that's gone. Now I want to just take the indicators off of this, this uh, chart. So I come over to, I make sure this is highlighted. I come over to the left and I click on Area Properties. And now I can see all of the indicators that are on this chart. There's a moving average indicator, there's volume overlay, there's a zigzag indicator. And I'll just click on the X to remove each of these in turn. And until I'm left with only the price. And that might be a good starting point and you might want to save that as a layout. What I'll do is I'll save that as price only and click OK. By doing that, what has happened is it is created under My Layouts. So every layout that you save will be listed under My Layouts, um, a layout called Price Only. So now if I happen to be on a different layout and then I click on Price Only, I come back to this basic, basic layout. From here, you can start building your own layouts. So to, to add indicators to a chart, you go to the script library. And what I like to do is click on the name header. Uh, you see, if I click on this, it sorts everything by uh, alphabetically. And so, for instance, if I wanted to add Bollinger Bands to the chart, there are two ways to add things to a chart. One is by double clicking. And I'll show you what happens if I double click. It's created a new sub area with Bollinger Bands in. That's not a great way to see Bollinger Bands. You want to see them around price in the main chart area. So instead of double clicking, I will drag and drop into the main chart area. Okay, so now the Bollinger Bands are in the main area. And now let me remove it from the lower area. I can just click the X here. You see the Bollinger Band indicator has gone away from this sub area, but they're still in the main area. So now if I wanted to um, put a different indicator into the lower area, for instance, on balance volume. If I double click, it's going to create a brand new chart area and add it as an indicator in that area. So double clicked. However, you notice I have this blank area here now because I did not remove it. So instead of double clicking, I can just drag it into the area and it now becomes an indicator in that sub area. Now that's useful if you want to put more than one indicator into uh, a sub area. You can just drag and drop it over the top of, well, into the area, and it then becomes an additional indicator for that area. You always know which indicators are in the areas because when the area is highlighted, if you go to the left-hand side and you look at, look at area properties, you will see a list of indicators that are in that area. For instance, and this uh, this gets gets some people confused a little bit sometimes, if you click in the main chart area, you'll notice there's the Bollinger Bands indicator, which I can delete. There's also an indicator called Main. Main is, is actually just the main price history. And if you delete this, you end up with a blank chart. Uh, and that can be confusing. So, uh, one way to get around that or get back to um, a decent looking chart would be to select your layouts and come back down to your, your basic layout. So you look under My Layouts, Price Only, and, uh, and we get that layout back. So that's one way to, to, uh, to do that. Another way is, say I've deleted the main, okay, so I have a blank chart. I can look down through my list of indicators and actually I have an indicator called main. So I can just drag that back over to the chart area and it now becomes you know essentially an indicator in the in the chart area. Not really an indicator. You can you could call it an indicator. It, it's price um, open high low close candles. Um, no volume. If you want to put a volume in, some people like to put volume on a separate um, chart underneath and some people like to overlay volume. 
there is, let me do both ways. So I'm sorting alphabetically. I'm going to search for volume. Okay, and if I double click on volume, it puts the volume into the sub area. If I drag volume over to the main chart, this is going to be a little bit confusing for you. Volume now takes up the entire chart. And what's the reason for that is the scaling um, is now set to whatever happens to have the maximum range. That's the, the maximum range on the scale. So what you can do here is is click on the main area, go to volume and say scale scale volume on the left axis. So now you see volume is scaled on the left axis and I could drag it down here to um, make it more reasonable. But instead of doing that with volume, if you want to put volume as an overlay in the main area, use the indicator called overlay volume. Overlay volume, drag that over to the main chart area. I still have to click on scale on left axis, but the overlay volume has already scaled this so it, so it doesn't take up the entire um, the entire vertical amount of space and it's also uh, made it a little bit more um, invisible so it's taken away s some of the it's made it a little bit more a little bit less opaque okay so uh, so that might be a good base to start charting from so I think uh, that's the basics of charting and and one of the cool things about the program, you won't find this actually in many, many programs, is for instance, if you had moving average, I can just drag my moving average over here. Now you'll notice that the parameters for the moving average defaulted to 12. Now I can just change that to be 50, and the moving average instantly updates. You see it sort of sprung to the, to into a place for a 50 period moving average. Or I can use these little arrow keys. And as I do that, I see the moving average will adjust each time I do it quite quickly too. So it's quite uh, it's quite a nice um, feature. Okay, so that's charting, and we are a half an hour. We're a half an hour already, so I think we need to <laughs> we need to get going on this. I wanted to talk about. Yep, yeah, we did that. Okay, so we'll talk quickly about back testing. Backtesting in the program, and the program was originally only a backtesting program. It had it had security charts. Security chart just means it's a chart of the underlying security. So it had charting, it had entries and exits as a tab, and it had trade simulation. It didn't have the templates tab. That's something new. Well, I say new. It's been around for uh, over a year now, probably a year and nearly nearly a year and a half. Okay, so we'll go to entries and exits, and this is the basics, the basis of uh, essentially 3D scanning, which I talked about before, and also back testing. So, what do I mean by that? Let's take an example. I'll take uh, from the system scans underneath the chart scripts. Remember, we already use chart scripts for indicators for putting them onto a chart. But chart scripts can do more than that. The uh, the scripts that listed under system scans are generally scripts that output either a one value or a zero value, a true or a false, to indicate whether the the security should be uh, selected or whether there's a signal on that security. So let me take the AUBB scan. I can either double click it or drag it over here, and you can see now this uh, has been popped into security selector and AUBB is a scan which looks for a cross of price above the upper Bollinger Band and when you put the uh, when you put the script into the selector area you then get to choose the parameters that you that you desire for that particular script in this case it's the parameters for the Bollinger Band which are by default 20 and 2 so if that's all I do, I won't have this volume filter or price filter set up here. What I would do then is, is choose a symbol list, and why don't I just choose the S&P 1500 that we already have data for. And all I would do is hit run. 
and you see it goes through the amount of data you have and it picks out for every single day starts on the right hand side of the uh, of this spreadsheet um, August the 1st 2012 was the first day these are a this is a list of all the stocks in the S&P 1500 that had crosses above the upper Bollinger Band on that day um, and a common theme in the program is if you ever double click on uh, anything in a spreadsheet it pops up a chart showing that symbol uh, and it will pop it up with whatever layout you had last selected so I'm going to because we're looking at crosses above the upper Bollinger Band I'm going to choose a layout that has uh, Bollinger Bands in so let's see if I have one in here with Bollinger Bands okay and if I don't have a layout with Bollinger Bands then it's very easy to create one all I would do is go to the script library and choose I like to use the area Bollinger Bands because it uh, it highlights the area between the bands and I've just dragged it onto the main area now what I've done this is a little show annotations um, button here if you have that selected you'll see the little edge event is highlighted and an edge event is just pointing to the day that you have selected in the spreadsheet and uh, and obviously the stock so if I use my mouse well, I could use my mouse but I'm actually using my the arrow key on my keyboard to just scroll down through this list of securities that have uh, crosses above the upper, upper Bollinger Band and as I go through um, I'm now going further and further through in terms of dates so I'm, it's becoming more and more current so you can see every single one of these occurrences is actually a time when the price crossed above the upper Bollinger Band this I mean very quickly you can get a feel for um, certain uh, certain things you know certain patterns occur you can get a feel just by doing this as to you know what potentially could happen after that pattern occurs so if somebody said to you when the stock crosses above the upper Bollinger Band then that is a time to sell because it's overbought you could quickly put that as a scan into the program and say and say well hang on a sec um, you know I'm looking at this and sometimes it crosses above the upper Bollinger Band and it and it continues higher so it's you know visually you can you can see exactly uh, what happened now uh, and I'll show you how to, to so that's visually how to do it but obviously you, you, it'd be nice to be able to get some actual statistics on that and you can do that with the program too so we've now got a list of um, these have, these have been put into the entries tab under entries and exits so this is a list of potential entry signals all through here so I could also put something into an exits into the exits tab and I would define another criteria for exiting uh, in this case I'm not I'm gonna leave the exits tab empty and I'm just going to use a uh, a basic time period hold so what I want what I'm trying to say here is when the stock crosses above the upper Bollinger Band what would happen if I held that stock if I bought it held it bought it long held it for X number of days so I go to the trade simulation tab and I can say in here take those entry signals place a long trade for every one of them place that trade on the close of the bar that the event occurred and hold that trade for five days and then after five days exit on the close and just by putting those settings in here and pressing run I can get uh, a list of all of the trades that, that were taken so 26,255 trades were taken over that over that time period and in this case it had a profit of forty six thousand dollars well what does that mean that that's all to do with the portfolio settings um, basically how much how many dollars per trade you wanted to place for each one you set that down under portfolio rules okay so that's 
uh, it's useful to see the the list obviously and you can sort the list just as you can sort any templates in the program by clicking on these headers so you can get the stock that that had the best performance uh, and as I said before a theme in the program is if, if you double click on a spreadsheet cell it will show you a chart and in this case because you've got an entry and an exit it's actually going to show you the entry highlighted when the stock crossed above the upper band and the exit highlighted uh, after five days so one two three four and that was the fifth day exiting on the close and of course while I have this up I can now scroll quickly down through the list I'm just pressing my down arrow on my keyboard and I can see all of the entries and all of the exits now of course I've sorted this by high profit uh, you know the best profit and loss to the worst profit and loss if you sorted it the other way around worst to best and you started looking at these you'd see some trades that uh, that don't look so good so obviously there's a number of trades that were successful and a number of trades that were not successful and that's where you would go down and have a look at um, the summary the summary shows you how many of the trades were successful in this case that 53 percent were winners 40 uh, 46 percent were losers and a half a percent didn't uh, neither were neither winners nor losers it also shows you the average profit in terms of percentage and dollars per trade so not very high 0.18 percent the average profit of the winners here was 2.45 percent and the average profit of the losers was minus 2.4 percent so um, you know it's interesting to look at these statistics what what you can also see on here is if you look at this uh, view up here you can see a histogram of all of the winning trades versus losing trades losing trades are on the left hand side of this blue line winning trades are on the right hand side and you can see that the most frequent bar occurrence is the 0 to 0.5 bar which had 4,000 just over 4,000 of the trades uh, made between 0 and 0.5 uh, percent. So you can see it looks like a pretty normal distribution. Maybe there's not really an edge in that and maybe maybe you then pass on it. You can also do other things like maybe you want to choose the time frame for which you're testing. You want to test this this strategy in an up market versus a down market. So you can change the, the dates and and, uh, and do your back testing like that. The other view in here is daily equity. And daily equity basically takes that list of trades and plots how the equity has changed uh, every day and the way that it works that is it goes to a, you know goes through the days and it says is the position that you're in did it did it uh, make money did it lose money so it's reporting on open positions as well as on uh, when you sell the trade on closed positions so it's an entire how your portfolio performs in that in that scenario and if you look at the bottom of the this green area here this shows you how many trades were open on any one day so right here in just before October 2012 we're looking at September you had various days where you had 800 open positions obviously this is not something that you would anybody could practically do but it's just trying to give you statistics, uh, statistics on the numbers it's not you know trying to implement a a real trading system that you would implement yourself in this in this case you could limit the number of trades that were taken by going down to the uh, portfolio rules and saying only take four only have four open positions or, or however many open positions you want if I did that now and I press run again things look very different mainly you've got four open positions but some days you've got you see the spike goes up to eight and the reason for that is is because uh, if you close a trade on one day and you open the trade on on the same day it's counted as essentially two trades in the, in this system but anyway you can do things like that so what four trades would it take in that case it would take from your list of entries the top four um, from top to bottom now you can sort this list and that's what the rank selector is all about it's about ranking this list uh, so if you had um, and what I've done now is I've clicked over to managed code from chart scripts 
this is where my rank selectors are. So I could say rank this by, there are several ways of ranking, but I'll say um, top N. I drop that in there. I can now choose to rank this by percent gain loss over a two day period. And I'll press run. And it, oh, sorry. The percent gain loss, let me just open that up. Right? Percent gain loss, close to close over a one day period. So it's the one day percentage gain. And the number of stocks it's going to rank. So it's going to essentially sort the list and then filter it by top two. But I'm, say I want to get 10 stocks. And if I press run now, this list will only ever contain 10 stocks per day. And now if I go back to trade simulation and I don't choose to have max open positions and I press run. All right, now we're, we're looking at uh, essentially a, a maximum number of open positions of 40. So you might think, you might wonder why that is. Uh, the reason is that you're trading every day and you're holding the positions for four, um, for five days. So it's possible to accumulate more than 10 positions. Every day you're taking 10 positions essentially. Okay. Um, Okay, so there's a question here from uh, from Wally, and the question is, can you modify the system scan, change the EMA50 closed down to SMA100 closed down? And now we're getting a little bit more in-depth. <laughs> Thanks. And uh, I might cover this in the next one, but I'll, I'll briefly answer that. I don't want to get too in detail about this. But yes, the answer is any of these indicators or scans are editable and changeable by anybody. And the way that you would edit a scan is, uh, well, let's look for the one that you mentioned. You, you said EMA50 CD, close down through EMA50. Okay, if I open this up using this little edit icon here, all right, it's a simple script. It's basically looking for a cross of EMA uh, the close of the EMA of close 50 period EMA of close over the close price so of course you could change this to be SMA and you could change the parameters to be that could be a hundred you could even parameterize it by putting the parameters in this tab I don't want to get into too much detail about this now but that's that's the way you would do it and once you've got your own scripts in there they appear under my scripts. So you never, you're never modifying the system indicators or system scans. They, they always uh, remain intact. But once you start editing one, it becomes one of your own custom scripts, if you like. Okay, you're welcome. Okay, so we <laughs> we have covered uh, simple back testing. Now templates. This this is this is really this is a new piece of the program, as I mentioned before. And the idea was that whilst all of this stuff, back testing, um, you know, trade simulation, d doing your entries and exits, is very very powerful. If you want, if you are, are trying to, if you have a daily process and you're trying to find stocks that meet certain criteria, for instance, cross above the upper Bollinger Band, you try and find that every day. Well, what you have to do, what you had to do, is come into your entries and exits tab, drop your cross above the upper bondage band in here, um, potentially drop a, another selector in here, press run, look through this list on the left hand side to find things that are occurring today. The idea with templates is it takes that um, all those steps, puts them together into one easy to run template. And I'm going to show you this, the simple steps to run any template. And they are as follows. First of all, come to your templates tab look through the list on the list of all your template categories is on the right hand side and there's an icon for each category it's important to know the distinction between a category and a template and uh, I'll tell you why um, right now if I select a category like the Jeffrey Scott category and I look over to my symbol lists you see that it's grayed out 
the reason is that you can't run um, you can't run a category. A category is just a container for, for templates. So the simple process, five steps to running any template are these. Number one, select the category. Number two, select the template in the category. This one only has one template. Oop, and I've already run this, so let me just reset that. So we'll go through the steps again. We'll press the category, we'll press the template, and now we'll select step three, choose a symbol list that I want to run this template on. Well, I already downloaded the S&P 1500, so I want to run it on that. Step four, update the data in the list so you have current data. Now this data is updated as of July 2nd. So if I run this template now, I'm going to, it's going to process the 1500 symbols. Okay, and it's now going to show me the results as of July 2nd, yesterday. Yesterday's close. Now I know the market has already closed, so we should have close price for today, but it takes a while for that for that data to become available. Well, one of the features of the program is, is an intraday update capability. So even when the market is open, you could press this little blue button here, intraday update. I'm going to press it right now. And it's going to go out and fetch from Yahoo. And this is the only place right now that it fetches intraday data. It's going to fetch intraday data, which is 15 minute delayed from Yahoo. And what you see has happened to the list is that uh, the to date has stayed is well has changed to uh, today, and the time has changed to the last time that we actually have data for. It was a, it was a short day in the market today. And apologies for those who uh, were confused by my meeting invitation where I said this would start half an hour after the market close. I forgot about uh, the early close today. Okay, but you can see I've actually got intraday data now for this list. And if I hit run again now, it's going to run exactly the same template. This time it's going to use the intraday data that I have. And so that is a way to get signals during the market um, and also immediately after the market's closed. If you run it 15 minutes after the market closed and you do the intraday update, you're effectively getting the end of day data for that day. So it's if, if, if you don't want to wait two, three hours to, for your data provider to give you the data, you can, you can do it this way. So now this template has run and you see that it's given me data for 7.3. Uh, with all of the various columns filled in. One other thing I should say about templates is whenever you run a template, we'll go back to the file system, it always puts the result into the reports directory. So I've run this now four times. Every time I run it, it puts a um, Excel spreadsheet, which is essentially what you're seeing within the program here. But within the program, you don't need to have Excel. And also within edge rates, you have other great features like if you double click on a cell, it will bring up a chart. But it also copies the exact same template into this reports directory. And you can open that up in Excel. Let me, let me do that. OK, looks very similar to within edge rater, right? It's because uh, the edge rater is, is actually just viewing the spreadsheet. So if you had a desire and the knowledge and you wanted to do some other sort of custom um, VB, VBA type coding around this data, or if you wanted to do other, and there was a question here earlier about pivots and all that kind of thing. If you wanted to do Excel functionality on the data, then you can do that within Excel, because once you're in Excel, you have full Excel capability. Of course, you need to own Excel in order to do this stuff. But now they have the option of... Uh, subscribing annually and it's only I, I actually don't know what the price is per year something like a $99 a year um, but you get to use all of the office applications including Excel so it's uh, it's a definitely a worthwhile thing to have um, yeah and it's a full Excel doc document but what it also means and I won't save this is that if you run templates every day 
and you run multiple templates every day, this directory, this f folder here, is going to fill up with a lot of um, reports. And they're not big, you know, they're not uh, a great size, but it can chew up space on your hard drive. And uh, occasionally I would just come into the reports directory and just um, select them all and hit your delete button. That would be probably a wise thing to do now and again. So for instance, now if I hit this run template again, and I go back to my directory, you'll see it's you'll see it's uh, empty right now, but as soon as this is finished processing this template, you will see the report is now created in this uh, in this folder. Okay. I wanted to talk a little bit about this this template, but but also before I do that, I want to quickly show you how to do the percent B buckets report. Somebody had requested this in an email prior. So uh, let's just move on quickly. I'll come back to this template in a bit. And I'm going to go down to high growth stock investor category. And then I'm going to look for percent B buckets report. Okay. So I clicked on the category, clicked on the template select a symbol list and then the, the percent B buckets report as Ian uh, shows and Jeffrey shows is run using the S&P 1500 list. I already have the data updated uh, and what I want to do is press run. This report actually does not use intraday data. This is one of the only ones that doesn't. It uses end of day data and you see the chart, um, the data flip back to uh, end of end of day uh, data when it was doing the processing. Okay, so uh, once you've run this report you then have your pie and the pie is you can s scan through the various days to find out how many stocks were uh, with percent B above the upper band and percent B below that's not above the upper band. The Above the upper band would be where your percent B greater than one uh, and this uh, this bar here, if if uh, the number of stocks below the lower band was, was right now you can see it's uh, less than 2% were below the lower band, but this gives you a profile of the market. So it's, it's you know very useful for kind of seeing the internals of the market. And you can scroll through various dates to see that information. This one was a, an extreme. 87% of stocks in the S&P 1500 were above the, uh, above 0.5, so above the mid band, and 20 over 25 percent were above the upper band and now if rather than seeing this as an overview you scroll through this spreadsheet to the very last tab in the spreadsheet itself not the last one but the the second from last one or even the third from last one you can then see where this information is coming from to produce that chart at the beginning so you can see the very last row here 7 2 2014 has a 72 and a 28 and all these numbers here and if I go back to the chart and I go uh, all the way through to 72 you say 72 28 and those bars correspond to the bucket data down here it's just a, a better a visual way of seeing the uh, the information so that is um, percent B buckets quickly and now let me quickly go back to this this new template oh, let me just look at some questions Okay, so Brad. Um, Brad asks, the first thing he wants to do when uh, running the program is update data. Of course, that's a very, uh, you know, that's, that's what you'd probably want to do. So a way to update all of these lists, you don't have to go to, into every single one and then press update data. That, you know, if you have a lot of lists, that can take, take a time. If you're only ever working with one list, for instance, um, I, you know, I normally only ever update my weekly options list, and so it's quite straightforward for me to just come in and open, select the weekly options list, and press end of day update. But if you have multiple lists, go to the home area, click on the symbol lists icon, and here you can choose all of your lists at once and then you can say update list data and that will go out to wherever the list is getting its data from and remember I said that various lists can get their data from different locations and whenever you hit the 
update, it's going to go to the correct location to get that data and put it into the program. And this is also where you could delete uh, more, to, more than one list at one time. So I hope that answers that. Okay. Now, uh, can you do buckets for anything other than percent %b? This this template is is actually specifically designed for for a percent %b. Um, the only reason really that it's specific for percent for a percent %b was because that was the thing that was the the interesting point at the time that I developed the uh, the template and I developed it for Ian Woodward of of, uh, of HDSI who many of you know but the actual underlying process should be extendable it's just that if you run this template it's only going to look at percent %b buckets if it was something that was more interesting and, and you were interested in looking at more than percent %b uh, then that's something I could put together as a separate template uh, where potentially you could choose what uh, you know how you're going to slice the the data. Um, okay. Now, do you have to you have HDSI to use the templates you offer? No, you don't. So, EdgeRater really, w when it comes down to it, EdgeRater is only working with the files that I showed you in the, the file system. So it's only really working whenever you run a template it's only actually working with data that's in your uh, snapshots directory for price history uh, your symbol lists directory for getting symbols um, so when you're running a template it doesn't really know about any other application so uh, if you if you didn't have HDSI you can still use the program as long as you can get the price history from somewhere else you know like like Yahoo for instance if I had set this this weekly options um, list up to uh, to get data from Yahoo like here then you know I'm, I'm not going to need HDSI for that for that so no you don't you don't have to have HDSI but it is a very useful thing to have because you it categorizes the information um, it downloads the updates uh, they do a whole bunch of processing to make sure the data is very clean and it also exists on your hard drive so um, processing that data is a lot faster Imagine if you had to get the S&P 1500 from Yahoo and looking for 10 years of data, you have to make an internet request for every one of those symbols, so it takes a lot longer. And if you do that process every day, it can take, you know, it just takes a little bit longer. And also, you know, people would like the, some people don't like the Yahoo data. Um, some people complain about, about it. Uh, personally, I find it to be quite, quite good. Um, but, you know, different people have different preferences for data. And uh, uh, most of the people, th um, well, I think 100% of the people who I met at Jeffrey's seminar own HDSI. So that's why I kind of have a little focus today on uh, on HDSI. Okay, um, let's see. Can you review how to find the actual stocks in any one percent B? Okay, okay, Brad. So Brad's question is what what I'm seeing here is essentially a profile telling me how many stocks are within each of the, each of the buckets. That's good for looking at the overall market. Okay, gives you a nice profile of the market internals essentially, but it doesn't tell you what stocks are in each of those buckets. What I would do to do that would be use my um, entries and exits and instead of looking for cross above the upper band uh, let me do let me do this if I was looking for stocks I wanted to know which stocks are, are, are have a value of percent B greater than one then I would use a scan in here and there is a scan in here already set up uh, called, um, let me just try and find it. It's called. Uh, it's called percent B greater than X. So I drag that over here. Now, the parameters are for percent B. Bollinger bands. The standard parameters are twenty and two. Okay, and I'm looking for a percent B greater than one. And I'm going to run this on the S&P fifteen hundred. 
And it's actually going to show me this for every single day in, in the history. But if I want to find just for today, or actually just for yesterday in this case, the, the very first column are the stocks that have percent %B greater than 1. And if I double click on that, you can see as I scroll through this list, all of the percent %B values on, the, on those stocks are greater than 1. So that, that's how you do it with, uh, with the entries and exits, or the 3D scanning, as I sometimes call it. OK, now we really have run out of time. What I want to do then is postpone talking about Jeffrey's template until next week. And I'm going to do another one of these webinars. And you can send me questions uh, via email. And if you put in the subject line, webinar question, and you click on, you go to the website, go to the support area, and you click on details and registration. You'll see that uh, next Thursday, 1.30, so same time next Thursday, uh, we'll do another one of these, and we'll, we'll just go through a bit more, you know, we'll just go further. And uh, I'll answer questions that, that you have in the meantime. Hopefully you have the program already. Uh, hopefully you can download the program in the trial version. And I should mention that... Uh, due to uh, popular request, I've extended the, the deadline for taking advantage of the special offer. So now if you go to edgerator.com, this is how you get the special offer, by the way. If you go to edgerator.com and you go to products, uh, click, go down to where it says pricing, and you'll see the, the standard pricing here. But if you click on the special offer, you will be able to pick up Edgerator Pro Unleashed for 11.97 until July the 18th. Give you, give everybody a chance to uh, to try it out, and that includes I the program. You get to keep Edgerator Pro Unleashed. You get to keep it forever, and use it forever. All of the templates that are currently available for the system, you get to keep those and use them forever. Plus, all of the templates that I release within the next year, and I said already that I I do one per month. You get to keep all of those in the next year and use those forever. So um, it's really essentially 11.97 and you get all that functionality. And then if you decide after a year that you like the way the templates are coming out every month and, and it provides you know, good uh, trading information, then you could subscribe after that time for another year of templates only for, for less than $300 for another year. So um, the cost to keep going is, is, quite, uh, is quite, good. It's quite good value. Um, and there's, you know, there's a little bit of a, of a jump to get in right now, but this is a great time to take advantage because of the 40% discount. And uh, I hope you can see that uh, there's tremendous value in this, in this program. And I continue to develop this, and I put a lot of time and effort into uh, programming templates every month. And uh, you know, a lot of people find it very useful for their, for their trading. So hopefully you can take advantage of this offer. But please go ahead, download the trial. You can get that from the products area too. Click on download trial. If you then decide to take advantage of the offer, you can plug in the serial key that you'll get into the trial version and it will unlock it to be a full uh, full version. So uh, that is that is it, I think. Let me just uh, check on here that I had anything. Yeah, so next time I think, um, in the absence of any other questions, and I'm sure I will get some, next time I want to talk about Jeffrey's template, pullbacks in an uptrend, how to find them. I want to talk about also the, the seasonality templates and how to, how to use those. So uh, please join me for that next week. Thanks very much, and thank you, and have, uh, have a great 4th of July. Thanks a lot. Bye now.